what I call my session today is, um, you know, doing good and doing well, because I know we are, we have, a we have many, many entrepreneurs joining in today from various parts of the country, uh, all of whom are extremely bright. Um, I've been, of course, privileged to be a part of the jury this time as well. And uh, so I, I read through a lot of the nominations and, and the details. So clearly, very, very exciting work all around. And what, what was amazing to see was the spirit with, with, with which, uh, you know, people sort of approached their business, even in the midst of this crisis. But having said that, you know, what I want to talk about today is the, the need for us to dramatically change the way we do business, not get out of the businesses that we are in, not not you know lose sight of what matters to our consumers but what really really matters today for me and i think for all business leaders around the world is whether our heart and our mind is is aligned and whether we create a new normal rather than waiting and hoping to go back to the way things were because if we go back to the way things were um, i think that will be one of the large best opportunities that we had to make a correction that would have gone waste so this, these times are unprecedented times. And, you know, clearly one thing that has come together quite, quite clearly is that we are all connected. None of us are isolated in an island by its, ourselves. But at the same time, this is not just an economic crisis. It is a social crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis. And more importantly, it's a crisis where our planet is in crisis too. And unless we rec recognize that, we will not be able to deal with some of the problems. At the same time, we've become a very unequal world. Um, you know, these are some startling statistics, you know, of how unequal the world has become. 3,000, you know, corporations around the world are, are causing $2.2 trillion of environmental damage every year. Uh, the rich are getting richer, even in the countries like the United States, let alone emerging markets like India. The inequality hasn't been as high as it is today in the last 100 years. Um, and that has led to civil unrest. It is, it is leading to flashpoints uh, on, 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 on various uh, you know, ends of the, of the spectrum. Um, and it's not just, it's, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's something that has, that, has been, uh, that has been building up for a while. Paul Polman, the famous uh, CEO of Unilever, pointed this out years ago. Um, and, you know, my current uh, colleague, uh, William Bissell, uh, who's, uh, who's the current uh, chairman of Fab India, he keeps talking about the need for a circle economy as well. And, um, and, and is it, is it any, any surprise that today work uh, is the number one cause of stress? And stress is, leading, is the leading factor to 80% of, of our deaths. Now, in this environment, then, as entrepreneurs, as people who are building businesses, um, as you look out onto the next, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of your life and you're trying to create a business, what do we need to do differently? What is our plan? Well, first of all, hope is not a plan. We can't hope that things will be different. That actually we are, we're, we're, we're creating businesses and we are most of the time running businesses in a way that is very short term. And short term does not mean just quarter on quarter. Actually, in the, even if we look at businesses in a five to 10 year perspective, I believe it's, and I've begun to realize that more and more in recently, that those are very, very short term targets. Because if the underlying resources, if the underlying um, you know, environmental and planetary needs are not met, um, we'll have a crisis on our hands. Now, there are lots of companies which are, are beginning to, to make um, trying to make a difference they're they're doing various things but at the same time the 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 stark realization is that this response is an absolutely inadequate response um, in in a positive move the united nations came out with these you know sdgs the sustainable development goals but the in but the hard reality is or the bad news is that it's it's going to take three and a half trillion dollars a year to be able to meet these sdgs and in that, we've got a 2% conundrum. What I call the 2% conundrum is that, you know, most companies in India, even the profitable ones, uh, dedicate about 2% of their profits towards a corporate social responsibility scheme. But the problem with that is 
with just 2% of the money going in, less than 2% of management time and a fraction of the leadership time actually goes into trying to trying to acknowledge these problems, trying to find solutions around it, and trying to create a world that is dramatically different from the way things have been so far. Um, now, therefore, what is it that needs to happen? What needs to happen is doing well in terms of creating profitability and doing good in creating social impact and a deep social impact around us has to come together. It cannot be that we are in a unidirectional run of creating profits and we just take 2% of our time at best and try to see how we can create uh, some good around it or you know, find a purpose, purpose to our business. So what is our one big objective? Well, let's go back to even businesses that I've been, I've been involved with in the past. When somebody talks about Indigo, they keep thinking about the largest airline, the most profitable airline, and the best on time, and so on and so forth. But actually, our purpose, our one big objective, was something very different. Our one big objective was to prove that low cost has nothing to do with low quality. And that ability to work in a very purpose-driven way is, I think, the secret sauce to some of the successes that I have seen in my life. And I've been blessed to work with people who are equally driven behind a passion. And then there are examples like this around the world. Um, take a 200-year-old take a year old baking company called King Arthur in Vermont in the northeast of the United States. It's 100% employee-owned. It is profitable. It garners a price premium for its products in, in the marketplace. It has an extremely uh, you know, loyal customer base. They make these really high quality products. At the same time, it is a B Corp uh, um, you know, organization and which tries to, is absolutely centers itself around trying to create a socially conscious business. Now as entrepreneurs, the bits that you will have to do is, we'll have to all make some very, very hard choices. Do we look at only creating shareholder value or do we start focusing on stakeholder value, which is a much larger you know, uh, pie? Do we only talk about what is now or do we kind of start planning for what's going to come and hit us later? Do we only talk about what matters to me or do I also look in the context of what is happening around the world? Because things will get worse before they get better. And unless we start waking up to this reality, the world will change on us, the planet will change on us, the consumer will change on us, and we entrepreneurs will suddenly find ourselves with a business model that doesn't work anymore. So Marshall Gans, um, who's, uh, who's a senior lecturer at Harvard, uh, said that you know, leadership needs to engage the hands, which means the skills that we require to solve a problem, our heads, to try to find a solution to and find a different way of thinking and our hearts because that is what inspires us and those around us to look at things dramatically differently. Because what I'm telling you to do today is very different from what any other venture capitalist or most other venture capitalists will tell you. It is very different from any other mentor will tell you. What I'm telling you to do today is dramatically change the way you do business. And where there is a will, there is a way. And there are giant companies who have been able to make a difference. Lipton, for example, you know, they went through a massive crisis 10 years ago. And then they realized that unless they go and fix problems that they have created for a long, long period of time and impact for the better the lives of you know, small tea producing farmers around the world, they will have a problem on their hands where the, the very resource material, the raw material of tea will disappear. And now they, 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 they you know, now source 100% of their tea from sustainable resources. Or for example, uh, another you know, Unilever example where they, where, they've tied, uh, where they partner not just with Walmart, but with, uh, with many other detergent manufacturers in the United States uh, many years ago, was when they came up with this thing called small and mighty. This is a detergent which could create three times more washes in, in one third the amount of detergent. So the package was smaller, 
you know, the amount of raw material was less. They were able to bring down the logistics cost. They were able to bring down the cost of, of distribution, was able to bring down prices. But they were afraid that when the consumer comes in and looks at all these larger bottles from all the competitors, Will they ever choose this small little bottle for the same price? And then they did something which is pre-competitive, which means they put everybody in the industry together and forced everybody to move towards a more denser detergent solution. Um, or for that matter, Patagonia, um, which kind of said, you know, there is a true cost of accounting where in the immediate terms, in the in a very sort of basic old legacy way, you can look at cost and look at the cost of your product and say, you know, if I if I work towards a more sustainable work towards more sustainable practices, then it's going to cost me a higher on dollars. But actually, there's an externalized cost which is going to impact the future of the business. So therefore, you start erring towards looking at at your business from an externalized cost perspective. And then take long term, you know, bets, which will create sustainability, not just for the planet and the people around you and your employees and your communities that you serve, but actually make sure that your business actually does survive after a few years. And, the, and, and, and this is actually from a Jewish rabbi who said that, you know, the values we align with are something which is internal to us. And then there are things that we do. And when those things come together and cross cross together, that's where our calling is. And I think, you know, I'm at that stage in life now where I, I truly believe that I think my calling is to try to create uh, businesses and try to get involved in businesses which create deep social impact. And, and there are many such examples like Rainforest Alliance, like the B Corp, where, where the economy is being designed very differently. This is something William uh, Bissell introduced me to uh, a concept that, you know, that our design of our economy, the way things have happened so far, it's, it's just, it's just faulty. It's, it's kind of broken. And the way we need to do things differently is where, where we need to meet the basic human needs of the planet. And that's what, for example, Fab India, uh, uh, an organization which is celebrating its 60th year in 2020 has created India's most profitable and largest and, and most loved, you know, retail brand, but done it in a purpose driven way, which is committed to service, committed to to their associates and partners and producers um, uh, of, of goods. And and look at this amazing example. And I'm so proud that I've I've got involved in something like this. And I mean, and, and William puts it in a very interesting way that 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 the new way of looking looking at life, and he calls it new enlightenment, is this alternative framework which kind of cares about the future of humanity and makes a commitment to taking this journey and raising our own state of consciousness, where we start aligning with what the context is. Rebecca Henderson, the the uh, uh, Harvard professor who who uh, teaches a course in sustainable businesses. Uh, and she's been working in, in this area for over 20 years, uh, says that there's a wheel of change now where there are shared values which are coming together with industry-wide cooperation. Uh, consumers are making more conscious choices. Regulations are coming in. And, and, and that is what is creating these, this kind of wheel of change, which is going to lead us to a completely different sort of economy. And it's not just the, these new age sustainable business types. But even Larry Fink, the, the, the chairman and CEO of, of BlackRock, the, the almost one of the largest private equity uh, firms in the street, has been saying this now for years and, and now more and more emphatically that purpose is the engine of long term profitability. So to people like you and me, especially for all those people listening in, the young entrepreneurs who are award winners today, congratulations to you. The opportunity is staring at us. And it is the top. It is now our task to create something which is fundamentally different from what has happened before. And those who separate themselves from the pack and realize that this is a true, true opportunity. And that's where lies the potential of your business. You will see that you can use technology to solve really hard problems to solve. And that will make which will make a deep social impact. And if you're looking for the next billion dollar, you know, unicorn idea. Drive out onto the streets of India, look out of the window, find a hard problem to solve, use technology to solve it, and make a social impact while, while doing so. And just to remind ourselves, 
even years ago, the first dean of Harvard Business School said that the purpose of the Harvard Business School, and, to, and, and since we're talking about purpose today, is to educate leaders who will make a decent profit, which is doing well, but decently, which is doing good. So I wish you all the very, very best. And I hope that um, you, know, you, you chart out a new course. Congratulations to all the winners. And best of luck and, and kudos to all of those who, who, who you know, were nominated. And I'm so glad to be here. And thank you again to entrepreneurs. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Uh, that was really uh, interesting to know from you. So before I uh, you know, pick up questions, uh, some of the questions from the audience that we have, uh, I would really want to understand uh, something from you. So yesterday Please. night, I was uh, asked, uh, talking to a friend who runs a small business in West Bengal, Filiguri, yes. and you know, so I, I told him that, you know, if we have to get the demand back, what we have to do is whatever benefits are percolating, we have to get it down to, you know, the last person on the road so if if banks are giving you a, a, a benefit, you pass it on to your employer and then, you know, he spends and the demand gets back. But he told me a very important, a very interesting thing. And I would want to understand from you. He said that, listen, we do not pay for someone from my heart. I do pay. But more than that, why I pay is because the value that he is creating for me. And that is that value that he's creating for me is helping me serve the demand. So now there is no yeah. demand. So, you know, he's not been able to serve, I'm not able to do, so this chain is going to be there. So how do you see it and how do you see that, you know, a person who's uh, who, who's got into such kind of a trap, how can he, uh, a, a businessman or entrepreneur, can help himself? Well, you know, the uh, long subject, but a quick answer to that is, first of all, um, if you are in the business of satisfying a fundamental need of the consumer, then don't get disheartened because that market is still there and the market's going to come. The bit that I would say that we need to take a good hard look at is that how can we deliver those same products at a different cost structure and using technology, using an online delivery or whatever is that, that, that good. And the third is that this is the time to have an, as a leader to have an open and transparent communication with your with your workforce and with your partners. And if they truly believe in your mission and, and they truly believe in that purpose, I have seen this many times over in my life that everybody kind of comes together and you're able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I was having a similar discussion only this morning with uh, another organization who are, who are working with some of the poorest of poor you know, women, women manufacturers around the country. And, and, and you know, we came up with, with a similar kind of solution. Um, if you're serving the fundamental need of the consumer, that market is not going away anywhere. Great. So I'll take a, a couple of questions that have come to us. So, uh, and someone has wished you a belated happy birthday. Seems thank to you. Be a thank you. Yeah, very sweet. Thing. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so Vikram, Vikram, thank you. So it's a Vikram Aditya, he seems to be a very big fan of yours. And he's asking you that I know you're a big fan of books. So what books are, have helped you to become uh, uh, such a super inspiring entrepreneur, if you can share? Well, to be honest, I kind of alternate between uh, fiction and nonfiction. So, and uh, I try to read as much as possible. Uh, but if I have to be truly honest to everybody here, you know, even the times when I don't get to, to read much, I'll probably watch a TED talk or I'll probably watch a little video. And these days, audiovisual is, is a great medium. And as much as I love reading and as much as I'm a big one on, on books, I also don't want to sit on an ivory tower and say, you should only read. There's a lot of great documentaries, great information out there so whatever is the source of information that you can that you can get access on go go right ahead you know mm -hmm. yeah okay but uh, but uh, if there was one book then i mean there's a there's a book by uh, clayton christensen uh, called how will you measure your life i think that's a very interesting book for people to read right now mm -hmm. okay okay so you know so it said that your past never leaves you so there is a question for you that what is happening with the aviation industry and what do you like when shall when shall it be back? I know it's a very indefinite question, but what's your views? The, like you know, the, we the are airline, we're, the airline we're, business. Yeah, the airline business. Yeah. So what you what like um, what what are we going again, to see from you? I I think I think the affordable segment of the market will recover pretty quickly. Um, and uh, I also think that right now there is an artificial restriction on people not being able to travel and not being able to fly. So so you know so this part of the business is going through a 
unnecessary shock but but travel the fundamental need for people to travel is not going to go away but people will also have a fundamental need to conserve cash so therefore i think uh, i think the affordable segment of the market will recover first okay 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 all right and what about the hospitality industry you been both in the both the places the industry which have been affected both uh, Uh, due to this pandemic, first was airline. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, ve- I think it's a very symbiotic relationship. Uh, but, but um, we are at, at even in the hospitality business uh, in Oyo, where I'm involved, uh, we've now seen about we, we're back to about thirty percent of what the pre-COVID, uh, uh, you know, occupancy rates were. There are some green shoots of recovery in China. There are some green shoots of recovery in the United States. Uh, Europe is doing, you know, much better than than any of the other markets. So clearly goes to show that as as these markets open up, I mean I think the traffic will start coming back. Mm. So you know we had Ritesh a few days back for one of our webinars, and he said that you know uh, he thinks that uh, you know intra like travels within the country to places where you can take your car and go, and these yeah. things will recover very fast and will be the remain the norm for some time uh, to come. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, and. Um, Yes, to yes to to some extent, in the sense that yes, that will that will actually recover faster because, um, but at the same time, what I'm also seeing is that people are being able to fly in and out of um, airports much easier than having to go through these various checkpoints and and things like that. Yeah. So Ritesh and I were actually talking about this on Saturday, and and uh, we were exchanging notes, and I and I said that you know I think the moment the the network restrictions on the airline goes away. Right now, they can only fly thirty-five percent here and forty-five percent there. Moment that goes away, I think you'll see much, uh, you know, freer flow of traffic. But naturally, hospitality and the airline business are pretty, uh, pretty symbiotic, and, yeah. and there is going to be a positive impact on that in in retail as well, where like in fact.